grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Our first hymn this morning is Ferris Lord Jesus. Wyatt, like to help Will light the candle? a seat for just a moment. A couple of announcements. Um, as usual, Heather has them in the back of the bulletin. Um, I'm just going to reiterate that um, the Reverend Canon Claude Schroeder will be here on October the 1st at 10. Um, I encourage you to come out. Um, you don't need to be a theologian, you just have to be interested. And um, he'll talk about his time that he spent in Egypt at the cathedral in Cairo. Uh, next Sunday is the blessing of the animals, and so far I know we have at least one poodle, mine, and one hedgehog, yours, Jacob's best friend. And um, there's a story. Anyway, um, so we welcome cats and dogs and anything else you might want to bring. Oh yes, we have Lilo coming too. Yes. And anything, any other animal, um, if it slithers or has scales or hisses, it needs to be behind something. So it don't get to me. Anyway, I'm happy to bless it all. Um, and you could bring donations of bleach, paper towel, kitten food, and clump, no clumping litter if you so choose, or you can add to the collection, and that will go to the Humane Society here in Estevan. 
Messy Church is beginning, and it, the first time Messy Church will happen is here from 4 to 6 on October 23rd. That's a Sunday um, in the afternoon at 4, and it's for everybody, for grandmas and grandpas and uncles and aunts and itty-bitty babies and everybody in between. Um, I always remember very fondly um, the time I was here and did Messy Church Eucharist here, and we did a craft, and Mr. Ledley was a hundred or more, and um, I have pictures of him in the crown that we made during crafts, so um, it's very much for everybody. So there's that. Now, something new that I just learned is um, not that the bishop is coming here for Thanksgiving, a rogation service on October the 9th, which she will be, but she will be bringing two um, other priests, I believe they're priests, um, Litchfield visitors from the Diocese of Litchfield, um, two will be coming with her, and they will be staying the nights of Sunday the 9th and Monday the 10th. They'll be staying with us. <laughs> And so I, I think I have a plan um, if the weather's good. So everybody pray for really good weather that weekend. Brian and I will be down camping at Boundary. Um, and so we're going to invite them down there. And so on the Monday, um, Sunday, Monday, we would invite you all to come and join us. Um, we'll have a fire. Um, we'll cook some hot dogs or hamburgers or whatever you choose to bring along. And we will, I don't know, maybe will sing, maybe, who knows, um, but it'll give you a chance to get to know them and to visit with them. If the weather's not good, we'll think of another plan and I'll be letting you know about that. <laughs> but otherwise, if the weather's good, I invite you all to join us there and to have some time with them. Uh, what else did I forget? There's a lot going on for the moment. That'll take us up. I'm away this week. Um, I'll be in Moose Jaw at clergy conference, um, but I will be checking my texts and messages and emails. So, I think that's all I have. And with thankful and respectful hearts, we remember today that it is our responsibility to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is Treaty 4 territory. We give thanks and respect to those who first occupied this land that we gather upon the Cree, the Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and the Métis peoples. Please rise. Oh no, don't. Something new. What else is happening here? It's first back to Sunday school and Wendy's going back there. It's my turn. We get back to our Sunday school story, our story. So um, I invite all of you to come up here. Um, kids of whatever age, if you are whatever age you want to come up so I was I watched them all come in the door this morning it's made me realize um, I'm shrinking yeah they all got so tall has anybody seen Wyatt oh my gosh or Charlie May or Will look how tall they've gotten now they're Taller all sitting down Taller, taller than us now. They're all taller than us. Jacob is towering. Yep. Welcome back, you guys. We missed down. you. We missed you. We missed you. <laughs> we did miss you, and we are so happy to have you back. So happy. Are you guys happy Sunday school is back? Yeah. It's been a long time since we've had Sunday school, and it's been a whole long time since we've been able to gather up here to hear a story. I want to talk to you about alarm clocks. Do you guys have alarm clocks? How do you wake up in the morning? D does your alarm clock go off? Yeah. Or do you wake up in the morning? I guess is a better question. <laughs> it's difficult. I, 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 for one, use my phone. I use my cell phone uh, for an alarm clock, and it's got a feature on it called snooze. Do you guys have that? Yeah. Do you use it? Yeah. So you hit the snooze button, and then you can sleep for 10 more minutes. And then it goes off again. And you can hit it again. And you can sleep for 10 more minutes. You could actually sleep the whole day away, right, if you did that. It's not really a good idea, is it? It kind of defeats the purpose of having an alarm clock, too, doesn't it? It is nice to get the extra sleep, but, you know, that's a problem. You could, you could be late for stuff. Maybe you are sometimes late for stuff. Never? Oh. He's good. That's because he's got a mom. But, yeah. <laughs> 
the, 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 the alarm clock sitting in that pew over there gets to make sure that he doesn't hit snooze too often. <laughs> anyway, did, did you know that uh, God sometimes uh, has to sound a wake up in our lives when we're snoozing? It's kind of like your mom waking you up. Yeah, yeah, he does. He speaks to our heart and he says, wake up, follow me. And sometimes we hit the snooze button and say, oh, not right now, I've got things to do. I'd rather do this or that. And we want to snooze through. We don't want to get up and follow God, right? However, we don't want to hit that button too many times, right? Because if we wake up too late, it will be too late. And we'll miss out on uh, what God has in store for us. Jesus told us a story uh, about a rich man who wore the finest clothes. He lived in luxury, beautiful house and everything that he wanted, he had. And there was a beggar named Lazarus who lay outside the rich man's gate. Lazarus had nothing. He was starving hungry, his body was covered in sores, and all he wanted was for that rich man to notice him and maybe give him a little bit of something to eat, leftovers from the rich man's table, anything at all really would make Lazarus happy. But you know what? Every day, the rich man walked by Lazarus ignored him, pretended that he wasn't even there, didn't even give him a second thought. I imagine he passed by Lazarus so many times he probably got to the point where he didn't even notice him. In the Bible it says Lazarus eventually died and he went to heaven. The rich man died as well and he did not go to heaven. He looked up and saw Lazarus was in heaven and he was with Abraham. So he asked Abraham to let Lazarus dip his finger in water and touch it to his burning tongue because where he was, was very, very hot. Abraham said, no, I won't do that. Then he reminded the rich man how he had enjoyed such good things on earth, or on earth, and Lazarus had absolutely nothing. The rich man then asked Abraham to allow Lazarus to go back to earth so that he could warn his five brothers so that they wouldn't end up like him. And you know what uh, Abraham said? He said, no. So the rich man finally gave up, but he figured out what he should have done on earth, but by then, of course, it was too late. God sends us wake-up calls all the time. He doesn't want us to miss out on all the good things he has to offer. Make sure that it's not too late, okay? Don't keep hitting the snooze button. In the morning, maybe, just once. Just once. But when it comes to God, don't hit the snooze button. Listen to what he has to say, okay? Now, we have Sunday school finally, but let's pray before we go there, okay? Dear Father, May we never be guilty of hitting the snooze button, saying, later, Lord. Never let us say that. Instead, let us rise up and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, let's do some Sunday school. Keep your phone on, Will. Okay. <laughs> see, our, our youth does double duty. They're downstairs, and then you'll see them pop up here again later. And uh, cell phones on. So having your cell phone on in church is totally permissible in that instance. Totally permissible. If you will please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we pray, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we sing number 365, or the praise.
Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered by your Holy Spirit into one, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the reading of the Holy Word. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of King of Ju- Judah, <clears throat> in the palace of the king of Judah where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Zedekiah had said, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, I am going to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. An Ammon, son of your, ne- your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, buy my field that is at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hannibal and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels in silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of the purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed purchased to Barak, son of Nerea, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Panama, in the presence of witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence, I charged Barak, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in the earthenware jar, in order that they may at last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be brought to in this land. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And we will pray our psalm, alternatively by full verse, Verses 1 through 6 and 14 to 16. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence. You shall not be afraid of any terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Because he is bound to me in love, therefore I will deliver him. I will protect him, because he knows my name. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and from which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made a good confession. I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time he who is at the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in the unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty, or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of life that is really life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is Fight the Good Fight, number 503 in Common Praise or in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man, lame Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. 
The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in a like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, then Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead? This is the gospel of Christ. To you, Lord Jesus Christ. Speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So after the last few weeks, over the last few weeks, selectionary scripture readings topic seems to remain fairly constant, money and what we do with it. And throughout Luke's gospel runs this theme concerning the necessity for a proper use of our earthly substance, what we have, our own, or at least what we think we own. We were quite forcefully reminded in last week's gospel reading, you cannot serve two masters, you cannot serve God and wealth. But this week, just for a bit, I want to talk about hope. I want to talk about what it is and why we have it. Sometimes it would be very easy to lose hope in the face of what's going on. Yesterday I was taking stock and I was thinking about the war in the Ukraine, hearing about women in Iran killed by religious tyrants dictating what they should wear on their heads diminishing numbers and lower energy in the church, and a storm which is a disaster for friends and former parishioners on the Ile de Medellin, where Brian and I used to be. But then one of my favorite memories from seminary pops up, a memory of a friend who died this summer, actually, the Reverend Canon Colin Clay, who was a priest, a professor, and a mentor to me. Now, I remember having lunch with Colin and Rabbi Roger Pavey and some other students. And we were discussing the morning's paper, which as usual was filled with all kinds of bad and sad news, bombings, natural disasters, missing children. And I remarked then that I didn't really know why anyone would ever bring a child into this world, into this mess, on purpose. And Colin said, and I can hear his voice because he had a distinctive voice, and he said, oh, I don't know. I sort of feel like Jeremiah, you know, buying a field and so on. And like the best lessons do, it caused me to go away pondering. What did buying a field have to do with this messed up world? So I did some looking, and here it is. Jeremiah is prophesying in about the year 5588 BC, around six centuries before the birth of Christ. And the Babylonian army is closing in and will soon besiege Jerusalem. Jeremiah is being confined to the court of the guard, in jail in other words, accused of treasonable activities. He's been a prophet for 40 years and nobody's listening to him. Not an ideal time in one's life to be investing in real estate. Jeremiah is told by God that he will have an offer from his cousin Hanamel so that he might redeem a field and keep it in his family. And it may be assumed that the field of Anathoth was now occupied by the Babylonian army in that Anathoth, Jeremiah's ancestral home, 
lay just beyond Jerusalem's northeast wall. Being unable to work his land, Hanamel is destitute, and invoking the law of redemption, the poor man asked Jeremiah to buy the plot. And it's up to the eldest of the family to redeem or buy anything or anyone that is in danger of being lost to the family. But it will bring no benefit whatsoever to Jeremiah. Even if Jeremiah wasn't in prison, he wouldn't be able to work the field because it was occupied by the Babylonians. Neither would he be able to sell it unless he could find someone else in the family to buy. Nevertheless, nevertheless Jeremiah redeems it and he buys the inaccessible, unworkable plot of land. And we wonder why on earth under his circumstances would Jeremiah buy a field? The city's under siege, he's in jail, the future looks bleak. Why invest in a field that will soon belong to somebody else? Would you invest in the future when everything points to the ridiculousness of that move? Would you spend money on something that looks like you will never have a chance to enjoy it? Jeremiah did. He not only bought the land, he carefully went through all the motions of the business deal, weighing out the 17 shekels of silver, signing the deed, sealing it, getting witnesses to the terms and conditions, and then he gives the deed to Baruch to seal the documents in an earthenware jar so that they may last a long time. Why? Well, actually, Jeremiah on his own may not have jumped at the chance to redeem the land that was offered to him by Hanamel. But the word of the Lord has come to him, and so he was convinced, and he acted. He listened. Jeremiah heard the Lord, the God of Israel, and he believed that houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Through faith, he acted and was convinced that the future would be changed. Jeremiah's hope was that God was a faithful God and a God of restoration. And the good news is that Jeremiah's God of restoration is our God, a God of hope, a God that keeps promises. Listening to God's word is pretty important in our life as Christians and for our eternal life as the rich man finds out in the reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jeremiah heard the word of the Lord and believed the rich man, not so much. This parable that Jesus tells the Pharisees is not meant to be a condemnation of the rich. Neither is it trying to describe the geography of heaven and hell. Briefly, the message of the first part, verses 19 to 26, we're told that the rich man who lived in the way that the rich often do, died as has the poor man Lazarus. Note that in the scripture, the rich man is not given a name, but he is called child. The rich man ends up in Hades where he's being tormented, but far off he sees Abraham and with him is Lazarus and he calls out to Abraham. He still doesn't speak to Lazarus, do you know? And he asks him to send Lazarus over with a drop of water because Lazarus for him is still just a nobody, a nothing. The rich man still doesn't acknowledge Lazarus after death any more than he had in life. He still doesn't get it. His sin was not being, being rich. His sin was being intentionally blind. It was not doing anything with his riches. He knew Lazarus' name, but ignored him at his gate where Lazarus had been dumped to scrabble after the crumbs from the rich man's table and to fight off the dogs. Sin is in knowing that the poor are there and not doing anything about it. Sin is in having much and not sharing it with those sitting outside the gates suffering the evils of the world. Lazarus has received the evil things in life but is now confronted, while the man, comforted while the man who is so rich in his earthly life now suffers in agony. Then the rich man has a thought for his brothers, and he wants them warned so that they may change and repent. And Abraham tells him, they have Moses and the prophets. He should listen to them. And the rich man says, well, if you send somebody who's been raised from the dead, they will repent. In other words, send, send, send the ghost. 
And then Abraham replies, if they don't re listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. And maybe it's a foremention of Christ. Abraham tells him and us that we have scripture. We have the written word found in the Bible to tell us, to show us the hope that is believing in God. Then comes the first letter of Timothy, which is much plainer speaking than either Jeremiah or Luke. And it tells us, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Last week marked the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II and Archbishop Justin Welby preached. I don't know if you heard it, but it's still accessible. You can either get it printed or you can listen to him online. Within the sermon, he said this, and I quote, in all cases, those who serve will be loved and remembered when those who cling to power and privileges are long forgotten. Lazarus has a name and he's remembered. The rich man, he's just the rich man. If we heed the he teachings of Jesus, we become servants, loving our neighbor in word and deed. If we listen to the word of God, we are guided into a life that is life, that is so rich, no matter the evils or the powers and principalities that surround us. A life in which there is always hope if we believe and have faith in the power of God to save. Hope is a fragile thing, and it's hard to hang on to sometimes. For Jeremiah in the sixth century before the birth of Christ, and for us, it's 27 centuries later. But we are secure in hope and in the knowledge of a God who is faithful to us, a God who promises restoration, indeed a God of hope. And for this, thanks be to God. Amen. And in the worship booklet that you have on page 11 or in your bulletin, will you please rise and let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand, sit, or kneel, as is your custom for the prayers of the people.
The response to the bidding, Lord, make us a loving people, is, and a caring people. Lord, the creator of all, give us a sense of respect for all people. Let your church work for the good of all and the uplifting of those who are down. We pray for all relief organizations, for those working amongst the world's poor. We pray for the church in its work in poor neighborhoods. We pray for all ministers, pastors, bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially for Linda, our primate, Sydney Black, and dead indigenous bishop, bishop, Barb, our deacon, Brian, our honorary assistant. For clergy attending the con clergy conference this week, and in gratitude for all clergy who have served in the diocese over the years. For Bishop Jane Alexander, assisting bishop, clergy, and people of the territory of the people. Every child matters. Remember the indigenous children who did not return home from a residential school. For survivors and their families. For truth, healing, and reconciliation. For Becky Frank and the St. Joseph Hospital Chaplaincy. For the Anglican Church of Burundi. For our companion diocese of Litchfield and Minyunga. For our ecumenical partners in the Lutheran, Anglican, Ukrainian Catholic, and Roman Catholic Covenant. Lord, guide us that we may be good stewards of what you have given us. Lord, make us a loving people. And, and a caring, caring people. We pray for all in the positions of authority that they do not misuse their powers for leaders of people and for all who make decisions about our future. We pray for the people of Ukraine, for peace and the laying down of weapons. Lord, we pray for all who have been separated from loved ones through war or circumstance, for those who have left home and become lost. We pray for all whose homes and lands have been spoiled by war, by a lack of respect for the earth. Lord, make us a loving people. And, and a caring care. people. We give thanks for all who taught us love by loving us, for those who gave us respect for ourselves and confidence. Lord, teach us to be open to the needs of others in our homes and in our communities. We pray for our church family, Jeff and Heather Pyra, and their children, Jacob, Sarah, Isabel, and Charlie May, Melvin Reed and his extended family. Guide us in our choices and in our friendships. Lord, make us loving people. And a caring people. We pray for all who lack well-being, the ill at home or in the hospital, we pray for friends and loved ones in their needs, in, for all ill and suffering people, especially Lyle, Robert, Terry, Robert Adams, Gail Brandon, Jody Bryant, Mackenzie Delaney, Aaron Ducart, Sherry Ducart, Frank Elbert, Nadine Elson, Wanda Fries, Dorothy Gates, the Reverend Dale Gilman, Dave Genter, Bob Haynes, Glory Haynes, Alan Hodges, Debbie Hubick, Brian Joseph, David McDonald, Michaela McPherson, Leanne McCarthy, Dorianne McGillis, Marge Miller, Arnold Newton, Dale and Walter Purvis, Julie Ricks, Les Saxon, Kim Smith, Candy Smythe, Wanda Stang, Lisa Vandevelt, Tom Wright, Mavis Zinovich, and those we name silently before you now. Lord, make us a loving people. And a caring people. We give thanks for all who have entered the fullness of joy and peace in your kingdom, for all who are refreshed and restored in your kingdom. We ask you to bless friends and loved ones departed, especially Marlene Hagar, Harriet Burks, Helen Cunnington, Barry Duncan, Edna Moore, Anne Winteringham. Lord, make us a loving people. 
caring people. Good and gracious God, make us sensitive in all our dealings with each other and with your whole creation. Grant that we may reflect your generosity in our lives and do your will here on earth, that we may come to rejoice in your heavenly kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And we exchange a sign of that peace with one another. And our offertory hymn is You Who Dwell in the Shelter of the Lord. And it's 531 in the Green Book or in your bulletin.
Let us pray. Eternal God, in Jesus Christ we behold your glory. Receive the offering of your people gathered before you and open our hearts and mouths to praise your great salvation, the same Jesus Christ our Lord. And using supplementary Eucharistic prayer one, found in the booklet on page 15. And we will reuse the responses in bold. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, lover of creation, we give you thanks and praise for in the ocean of your steadfast love you bear us and place the song of your spirit in our hearts. When we turn from your love and defile the earth, you do not abandon us. Your spirit speaks through Hulda and Micah, through prophets, sages and saints in every age to confront our sin and reveal the vision of your new creation. Joining in the song of the universe, we proclaim your glory singing. Gracious God, in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus the Christ to share our fragile humanity. Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, you open the path from brokenness to health, from fear to trust, from pride and conceit to reverence for you. Rejected by a world that could not bear the gospel of life, Jesus knew death was near. His head anointed for burial by an unknown woman, Jesus gathered together those who loved him. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to his friends, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, gave you thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And now we gather at this table in response to his commandment to share the bread and cup of Christ's undying love and to proclaim our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Breathe your Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the universe upon these gifts that we bring to you, this bread, this cup, ourselves, our souls and bodies, that we may be signs of your love for all the world and ministers of your transforming purpose. Through Christ, with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, creator of all, and we bless your holy name forever. And now, as our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. I am the bread of life, says the Lord. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Jesus, 
So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more, you who have been to this sacrament often and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. salvation.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, strengthen the unity of your church so that we who have been fed with holy things may fulfill your will in the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we say, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. I thought I had a sneeze, sorry. Um, our final hymn is, whew, Be Thou My Vision. Of course it is. Be Thou My Vision. Just before the dismissal, I remind you that Alan has made coffee for us downstairs, so I will see you all down there. I give thanks for Alan. He is so faithful in making coffee. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all... I already said that. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Nobody minds being blessed twice, do you? <laughs>